Good morning. Nice to see you. We're working our way through the Ten Commitments, and these couple pivotal passages for the Ten Commitments come from Hebrews um, chapter 4 and chapter 8. In fact, the commitments right come from right from the text. The first four commitments are God sees you, and God sympathizes with you, and God deals gently with you, God loves you. And these four commitments come from the end of Hebrews chapter 4 and the beginning of Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to look at that passage this morning. And what we'll notice that in this passage, the word of God is anything but gentle. We're going to focus on the third commitment. God deals gently with you. But what we're going to see is that in this passage, the word of God, as it's described here, is anything but gentle. Let me tell you what I mean. Here's what it says in Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Um, We described the picture that it creates here. It's imagine yourself naked and uncovered. Somebody over the table has a sharp double-edged sword, tells you to put your neck back. Guarantee if that were to happen and you are the person on that table, your perception of this individual would not be gentle and you would not be restful. And that's the image that this passage creates. It's referring to the word of God that existed at that time. In the first century, the word of God would have been the 39 books of the Old Testament. In this passage, the word of God is not gentle. In fact, if you wanted an image of it, it kind of strip searches us. It judges our thoughts and attitudes, not just our actions, not just what we do, but why we do it. And it would seem from this description that the word of God is not gentle at all. However, appearances can be deceiving. In the very first chapter of the book of Hebrews, it talks about the fact that God is articulate, self-revealing. He's always trying to speak himself out to us. Listen to what it says. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. What we learn that God is by nature self-revealing. He's an extrovert. He speaks himself out to us in creation. There's things you can know about God's power his invisible qualities as you look at the world that he has created. But he also speaks to us in other ways. It describes in the Old Testament, God spoke to us through prophets and apostles. But there came a point at which God's revealing of himself took on a very sharp, clear character. It says Jesus is the exact representation of his being. It's the clearest articulation of what God is like. And this revelation through Jesus trumps every prior revelation. And if there's a difference between the way we see Jesus revealing the Father and the way the Father is revealed elsewhere in the scriptures, what we are to understand is that Jesus is the digital signal. Everything else was analog. And that if we want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus because Jesus is the exact representation of his being. And what was Jesus like? Because that tells us what God is like. 
deeply, most truly about, this is what it says about Jesus, here's what he said. In fact, it's the only place in the Bible, and I looked, where Jesus says, I am, and he supplied an adjective. If I were to ask you how you're feeling this morning, you might say, I am frustrated. I had to wear a mask. I am glad to be here. You'd put a adjective with it. And there's one place where God, Jesus, supplies an adjective, just one, that I found. Here's what it says. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Here it is. For I am, you know what it's going to say? Gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus was gentle. You know what this means? No matter what we find elsewhere, God revealing himself, if we really see who God is deeply, he is gentle. Rest, Jesus described, is the experience of connecting with God in an authentic way. If you are connecting deeply with God, and it doesn't happen all of a sudden, it's a process. The closer you get to God, the more you understand him, you will find yourself less burdened, more rested. And the rest comes not just from what Jesus reveals about God, but how he reveals it. It's not just the truth, but the way the truth is verbalized, declared, gently. Rest is a function of both. When someone speaks for God over a period of time, what should happen if what they're saying about God is accurate, there should be a progressive experience of rest, a lightening of the load. Here, listen to what it says. Um, Jesus said to the crowds in describing him, his influence, he described it as restful. And what that means then is if you come out of a place where somebody is speaking about God, and if you come in like this and you leave kind of like this with the load on, that wasn't a very clear representation of what God is like. A clear representation of God would lead you to, to come in like this and leave like this. And that's not just because it's nice. That's just accurate. That's what Jesus said. There should be rest. And God points out that if you, on an ongoing basis, there's a weight, a burden, that's not a good sign. Listen to what Jesus said. He said to the crowd and to the disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. What he described is the influence of religion at the time. It was this, and what Jesus said, it's not right. That's not an evidence of connecting with God as he actually is. God's decided to install High priest, and we'll talk about high priest a little bit. High priest is that person to and through whom you entered into the presence of God. They were a critical person. They were a person, flesh and blood being, that you could come to in order to connect with God. That was God's decision. God the Father decided to install high priest because of his desire that those who come to him I want you to listen to me, would experience sympathetic and gentle spiritual influence. When it's authentic, it's sympathetic and gentle because that's what Jesus was like. Um, it says in Hebrews 4, 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, 
But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. A high priest is God's ordained professional at dealing with sinners. If you don't deal with sin, you have no need for a high priest. And you can just turn your, turn your ears off. Turn your, well, I can turn my ears off. You can. I just take my hearing aids out. My ears go off. Anyways, um, it's, if, but if you have a sin problem, if you deal with sin, then this is the guy you need to know. The high priest knows exactly what you need to do with it. If you don't deal with sin, again, you don't need a high priest. We learn about the character of high priests in this passage, why God installed them. Listen to what it says in the verses just following Hebrews, the end of Hebrews 4. It says, every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. To deal gently is a really interesting word, and that's what we've got to understand. What does it mean when it says every high priest is able to deal gently? Literally, what that word means is moderately passionate. It's somebody who is neither manic or depressive. It's somebody who is neither overjoyed or disappointed. Somebody who is neither delighted or disgusted. That's what moderately passioned means. And what it says about Jesus is that that's the way he deals with us. Moderately passioned. He's saying, well, that's kind of strange. We don't want God to frown at us. But we do want him to smile at us, don't we? It's interesting. A friend of mine told me a story. And as he's describing it, he went to see another friend in another part of the country, came to this person's house, and this person, um, hey, how you doing? And the person had a dog. And he, this friend of mine was warned about this dog, says, this dog is kind of tricky. (laughs) He, He looks docile. And like a really nice dog. You know, he just sits there, what a nice dog. And then what you do, when people go towards him, he snaps at them and bites them. And so, uh, my friend going, uh, heard this, and this person, his friend, said, you, so watch out for my dog. You know, he'll kind of sit there, and he'll be all hippy yippy and happy scappy. And then you go to pet, oh, what a nice, you know, boom. You know, then, so here's what happened. And so, uh, friend knows something about animals, and so he went in, and there's the dog, and he's being a nice little dog. And, and so here's what happened. And my friend told me about this, and it was very puzzling, but it's kind of interesting. He went towards the dog, knowing what would happen. Oh, and the dog lunged at him and tried to bite him. And here's my, this guy telling me the story. My friend, here's what he did. He leaned in, the dog And he went back, and then he leaned right back into the dog, completely unafraid. What do you imagine that dog did? He told me the story. That dog yipped and skipped and shook its tail and pranced for about a half an hour. And we talked about why in the world would he do that? Why would a dog who has just lunged out be glad that somebody wasn't reacting to it. You know what I think this dog found? He was looking for an alpha. He was looking for someone he didn't have to control. And finding this person who was not reactive to him, understood him well enough not to react for this dog, you know what that represented? Why don't you listen to me? Safety. Safety. Here's a person, this dog's thinking, I can't make this person afraid. I can't make him overjoyed. Here is someone who is bigger than me. Here is someone I don't need to control. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, 
God doesn't react to you. God does not react to you. If you do something that's disappointing to you, God doesn't react. If you do something good, he doesn't become overjoyed. He knows you too well. You do not control God by what you do. If you don't do what God wants you to do, I guarantee you, God doesn't have a bad day. If you don't do what God wants, he doesn't sit up in heaven going, oh my goodness, Brett did it again. I, I can't believe it. And he doesn't because God knows us too well and is too confident and secure in who he is to be controlled by us. That might seem like something that is, well, I don't know how I think about that. I don't know what I think about that. I think there's something here. God knows you too well to be disillusioned or disappointed in you because he is neither illusioned nor appointed about you in the first place. He knows us too well to be surprised by us. You know what ends up happening as we that sinks down into our minds? We start to understand, you see me. You sympathize with me and you're big enough to deal gently with you. There's a lot of books that describe the attributes of God. I'm going to suggest one that I have not seen in the books, but I think might should go first or last, depending on whether the important one is first or last. This is it. To be divine means that God is at rest. God is powerful enough not to be reactive to anything. Again, to be divine means not to react because you are not threatened by anyone. You're not surprised by anything. What the Bible says, make every effort to enter God's rest. We grow up believing that we control God by what we do. And that's not the truth. That's kind of the way we think about things. And we all think that way, little by little. You know what God wants you to understand? He sees you. God sees you. And he sympathizes with you. That's why he sent a high priest, so you could know it. And he deals gently with you. Um, he calls you to the throne of grace to speak freely with him. That's why he tells you, you have a merciful and faithful high priest. And he tells us that so we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. There are three reasons why we don't approach God. And again, we can't actually walk to this place but he invites us to come into his presence. There's three reasons why we have a hard time. Pretense, fear, and shame. We might have a hard time approaching God because we pretend that we're really better than we are. We, you know, we talk to God and we say, God, I'm so happy today. And we really aren't. So we pretend and then we don't really approach him honestly. Or some of us are afraid to approach him. We're afraid of what he might do. We're afraid of what he might think. Some of us are ashamed that we've done or said things and we imagine that God's going, I'm so disappointed in you. Here's the deal. When you realize what God knows, there's no need to pretend. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. When you're talking to God, tell him the truth. We say, God, I'm sorry, I didn't want to do that. Yes, you did. <laughs> what we find is we, we try to tell the reasons why we don't come to him. And when you think about it, what this passage is doing, it's inviting us to come to the throne of grace and it's telling us to speak freely with him, honestly, openly. There's three things that would keep us from doing that, pretense, fear, and shame. And the things that this passage tells us about God helps us to deal with that. It says nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare. 
And when you understand what he knows, you don't need to pretend. He already sees the truth, so we might as well tell him the truth. When you understand who he is, you don't need to be afraid. Sometimes we're afraid to approach God because we think that he doesn't have any room for people who deal with what we deal with. But he's a, Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest. And if you're a sinner, he's exactly who you want to see. It's like going and feeling sick and going to a doctor that understands. That's the place you really want to be. I'm so glad I got into the doctor. That's what Jesus is like if you deal with sin. So when you understand who he is, a high priest, you don't need to be afraid. Sometimes it's not really pretending or fear that we deal with, it's shame. We feel that we should be farther along than we are. I should be more spiritual than I am, and we become ashamed. But when we understand how he feels, we don't need to be ashamed. He sympathizes with our weakness. He's a merciful and faithful. It's hard to approach somebody we fear. I want to tell you three things about God that will, if you keep them in your mind, help you to develop slowly a mental representation of him that will help you come close to him. God sees you. And he sympathizes with you. That's why God the Father decided that you need a merciful and faithful high priest who is Jesus. God sees you. God sympathizes with you. God deals gently with you. Make room in your heart for God's commitments. If you haven't gone through 40 days with the Ten Commitments, do so. Make room in your mind for God's commitments, his character, because these truths will transform you, enable you to come to the throne of grace and speak freely with him. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the fact that you make commitments to us and understanding that these reflect who you are as we see clearly what you're like looking at you through Jesus. Over time, we become more comfortable with you. We perceive gentleness and we start to relax. We start to be a little bit freer. This takes a while. It doesn't, well, it takes a long time, actually. We instinctively retreat from you. I pray that you'd help us to understand and make room for the fact that you see us and you sympathize with us and you deal gently with us and you love us, that you change us and you choose us and good's ahead of us and good's guaranteed to us, that you give us the power to persevere. You give us the power to be content. Thank you for these things, these truths. In Jesus' name, amen.